All right, welcome back to round two of our localization practicum presentations. Last week's presentations will be available shortly on the TLM website and on our YouTube channel. In case you didn't ra watch round one, I should introduce what's about to happen. Basically, translation and localization management students form small teams of three to five classmates and partnered with one or two nonprofit organizations to translate and localize content into and out of up to the eight languages we offer here at the Institute. So thanks for watching. Uh, a big thanks to the TLM students for their enthusiasm in helping these organizations go global. Uh, first up, we have Peter, Tiny, June, and Katie from Transforce. They're going to talk about their website localization project for the Global Heritage Fund, which is an organization dedicated to preserving cultural heritage in developing regions around the world. So take it away, guys. Thank you, Max. Morning. Uh, our group's name is Transforce, and our um, client this semester is the Global Heritage Fund. Global Heritage Fund is a nonprofit organization based in San Francisco. Its mission is to sustainably preserve cultural and heritage sites in developing regions. For the past 15 years, GHF has helped to preserve many cultural sites around the world. Before I go into more detail about our project, I want to first introduce my teammates. Katie right here is our project manager. Tenny is our engineer and reviewer. June right there is our account manager and localization engineer. And Peter, which is me, I'm the project coordinator. For the project, we provided website, video subtitles, and DTP services to our client. In terms of translation, we are only going to simplify Chinese. The entire project has 24,000 words. The China pilot project has 7,000 words. And the full scale project has 15,000 words. And we also told our client that we all finish everything before we graduate, which is around mid-May. Before we started our project, we told our client our workflow. We told them that while we were looking for translators and making localization kit, we needed the source files from them so we can make a copy of their website. Once we are done with translation and editing, we will incorporate that onto that copy site. And then we will give it to them for review. Once they are OK with everything, we will incorporate that onto their actual website, do a final check, and deliver the final project. However, due to um, some third-party website management issues, um, we couldn't get the source files from them, so we have to make some adjustments. Right here, this is um, our actual workflow, which is now that much different from the one before. The main difference is that we have to make a demo site, and then we just put everything we did onto that demo site instead of incorporate everything onto their actual website. Now, Kenny is going to talk about the tools that we use to finish this project. Kenny, it's all yours. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so here you can see all the tools we use for the project. For localization, we choose WPML because it is a free tool for nonprofit organizations and got all the features we need to translate the posts and pages and also strings and generate multilingual menus. Uh, for translation, we choose Metcat because it is also free and it is based on the cloud and uh, integrates all the great features like translation memory and machine translation in it. And for the Asana and Google Drive, uh, our project manager, Katie, will talk about that later. Uh, so here you can see the demo site compared to the original website. Uh, it is basically a simplified version of the original site. Then why we need the demo site? First, uh, we want to show our clients how the website is going to look like when it is fully localized and uh, how it's going to work. And second, we can use this uh, demo site as a sandbox to play around with all the tools and optimize our workflow and also identify some issues and try to find out solutions at an early stage. And actually, uh, in, the, in an ideal world, we should start translation only when the demo site was fully in place. 
and so we don't need to manually extract content from the HTML pages. But in the real world, when we realize we won't get the database, we need to close the site. Uh, the pilot project is close to the end. So the demo site starts with only four pages uh, we did for the pilot and was later extended to 14 pages when the full-scale project was halfway over. And then how we create a demo site. Uh, so the first step is to design a site structure based on the original one. And then we extract content from the HTML pages we get from the client's website and uh, add some plugins to recreate the functionalities and also the layout. And then we need to customize the appearance of the demo site. And then we came to the translation process. Uh, we create translation pages using WPML and put the translation in them. And the last step is to translate all the widgets and the themes using the string translation in WPML. So here you can see these are some of the uh, plugins we use for our demo site. Then next June, we'll talk about the translation kit and vendor orientation. Thank you, Tenny. <coughs> so yes, I'm going to talk about how we support our vendors during our project. Um, this is what we offer for our, for our translators. We have a translation kit for all vendors, and we also have this remote training program for our Shisu volunteers. This is a preview of our translator's manual. It includes a brief introduction of our project and client. And we also have the step-by-step -step guide of the tools. We also have an alternative for the translators to use their desktop CAD tools if they want. Um, actually, during the TEP process, some translators got back to us that they had a hard time uh, with the revised mode in MateCAD. And we review the menu again and realize that it might be a little wordy for the translators to read through. And when we um, review the part of the revised part, um, there's actually fewer screenshots in that part. And it might make it uh, harder for the translators to grasp that skill. So yeah, that's something we could have done better. The, as for the style guide, Actually, we basically provide the translators with general conventions of language style and standards like the time formats or things like that. The problem we met is that during the translation, um, translators were confronted with some new situations um, that we didn't cover in our guide. For example, how to translate the translator rated Chinese names back to Chinese. So actually, we kept modifying our guide during the project, but the problem is that some translators didn't refer to the updated version. So yeah, it took a while for us to keep the consistency. For the glossary, we um, used a tool called Termine to extract the frequently repeated terms from the website and translate it after cleanup. Ideally, we should have done a regular update to the glossary, but uh, we didn't tell our translators in advance that they actually should bear in mind that they could do this update to the glossary. So that is also a lesson learned. So along with all these documents we offer our vendors, we also provide an online real-time training program for Chinese volunteers. Um, I wonder if you happen to be familiar with the instructional design model called ADDIE, which refers to analysis, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. We um, actually follow this model and try to create a reasonable workflow to implement the training effectively. Actually, the hands-on practice could help our um, translators and us to troubleshoot possible issues that they might um, come across later in the real project and solve them in advance. We didn't include the MISS students in this process, and later we need some more efforts to support them individually to do the troubleshooting. So that some would prove that the trainings is helpful and necessary. Yeah. So next, Katie, our project manager, is going to talk about our full-scale project and pilot project. Um, so since uh, we didn't receive the source file from our client, we first created a 7,000-word pilot project with 
four missed translators for uh, four weeks. Uh, it was our initial website localization project, so we communicated with each other actively on Asana. And as a project manager, I assigned the work to our team members on the Asana calendar, uh, which sends the notifications to people that I assigned the work. It allowed us to finish our work before the deadlines. We could also leave some information or comments on this conversation section in Asana. Uh, we could save and store files in Asana, but since there is no folder system, it was not easy to organize our resources. So we decided to use Google Drive for our file organization since it allows uh, us to have hierarchical structures. And as you can see, we can save our files in folders in other folders. Our team used Makeit as a cat tool for our projects. And we can check the translation progress and four links for translation in this screen. You can start your translation when you click the link. So I sent emails to missed translators with the link, a style guide, and a translator's manual for them to start their translation. This is an editing mode in MateCat since it looks different from STL Trados that many translators are familiar with. Some translators couldn't know how to do the editing here, so we realized that kick of meeting with translators is very important for the better communication and for the better understanding of the project process and how to use the cat tool and so on. Our, so our, our pilot project was great practice for us to launch the uh, 15 word, thousand word for a uh, full scale project with 14 Shanghai International uh, Studies University is called Shisu Translators for six weeks. I communicate with them only through Asana since they're, they are all located in Shanghai, China in a different time zone. So I uploaded the make it links, style guide, and a translator's manual on Asana. However, thanks to the training and the better communication with other te our team members, Shisu translators had a good understanding in MakeCat and, uh, and our project workflow, and nobody was late in delivering their final translation. In addition, we used the translation memories that we made from the pilot project on MakeCat for the full-scale project. It's easy to add the TM to our new project on MakeCat, but when the number of TMs increases, since the TM key is a complicated combination of numbers and alphabets, the organization of TM will be necessary. And Tani is going to be next. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so maybe you've also noticed uh, we created a demo site for uh, in-context review. Uh, so before delivery, we need a final check to make sure as the demo functions properly and everything is in the right place. Uh, so we designed an in-context review sheet and did the in-context review with the help of all the translators from China. Uh, here you can see they need to report issues and identify the error types and leave their comments and suggestions on a new translation. So basically, uh, we prioritize all the errors into four tiers. Mismatch, text overflow, and broken links are of the top priority because the website won't function properly or display as expected with these links. And the second tier goes for like grammar typo and terminology. Uh, and the third and fourth, including mistranslation and style and fluency, uh, the last two errors are actually uh, part of the linguistic QA before this functional QA. And style and fluency is not uh, really required for this special project. It is only something nice to have. So here comes our good enough principle. We are not trying to achieve the best quality in this project, but the best possible quality under the given time frame, budget, and quality expectation. Thank you, Tani. So next I'm going to talk about the value added projects within this frame of website localization. We did the video subtitling for our clients. This is the workflow we used. 
and we since we didn't have the access to our clients account on YouTube so we offer a guide for them on how to import the subtitles in YouTube we also work with two PDF mm -hmm. files this is the workflow and we first we recreate them in Adobe Illustrator since we didn't have the original designs mm -hmm. so after the TEP is finished we adjust the content and layout we found out a problem that if the DTP specialist is not familiar with the target language, it might be really difficult for this person to adjust the layout, especially concerning with um, the cutting of the sentence, if, if you can see over there with this manifesto file. Um, yeah, our project is pretty much it. Um, here are the deliverables of our project. Beside the things we have mentioned, we also offer our client with a document on some future localization tips. So there are two special tips I'd like to point out. One of them is the payment method. As some of you may know that the most popular online payment method in China is not PayPal, but a local brand called Alipay. So if our client is trying to attract the donors from China, they might have to consider offering this paying me method for the future donors. And the other one is about the video sharing platform. Um, actually, YouTube is not always accessible in China. So um, since we have done the subtitle localization, we hope that our client could upload the videos to some local video platform in China for the audience to view. And we can never thank our volunteers enough because they are being really supportive during the, the project. So we um, not only ask them kindly to do the survey for us to um, evaluate our back and forth work and we also offer them a certificate of participation to appreciate their contribution to our project. So now Peter is going to show our demo site. Demos. Okay, now I'm going to show the demo site. Okay. Here is the English homepage. When you click on the Chinese tabs, it switches to the Chinese homepage. As you can see, the layout for the Chinese homepage is just like the English one. And then when you go to the bottom, um, click on one of the links, it'll take you to that page. On this page, you can see one of the video subtitles that we did for our client. Um, all you have to do to see the Chinese subtitle is to just change the setting. Chinese leaders ask for help from UNESCO's World Heritage Organization. There it is, the Chinese subtitle. The UN called the Global Heritage Fund in Colorado, California. And then here is about us page. You can see the localized uh, manifesto that we did for our client. Here is a PDF version. And then now we are going to their staff and board page. This page is very text heavy, also with a lot of expandable tags. Uh, here is another demo page right here. Also pretty text heavy with a lot of tabs. Uh, and then button, you click on there, take you to another site. Uh, yeah. And then we are just doing some clicking around right here. And then this page is, um, has a pretty complex layout. And then here is a membership form in PDF format. And then now we are going to the donation page. Hopefully after this, they can get more people to donate. And then when you want to go back, just click on the logo and they take you back to the home page. That's it. <laughs> Thank you for listening to our presentation. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Transforce. Good work. Next up, we have CSA Studio, made up of Chang, Sophie, and Amber. They're going to talk about their project with the Butterfly Children's Hospice, an organization that provides care and treatment for children in China with serious illnesses and helps families helps their families go through these difficult times. CSA Studio. Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to our presentation. We are CSA Studio. Um, our studio is a student-driven studio that uh, builds your localization, 
the localization solutions. There are three people in our team. Sophie is our account manager, Chang, I, I'm Chang, the vendor manager, and uh, Amber is our localization engineer. We are all project managers. Our client is Butterfly Children's Hospices. It is a nonprofit organization that provides care and treatment for, um, uh, for children with serious diseases. And we did three projects for our clients, audiobook localization, document translation, and the website consulting. We have many people working collaboratively with us on these projects, and we devoted most of, of our effort to audiobook localization and the rest of the time for the other two projects. The projects lasted for four months, and throughout this uh, project, we use a number of uh, tools. For example, Momosource is our CAD tool, and we use four tools for DTP, including Audition. We use three tools for the overall project management. We use Google Drive to share, sort, and also to um, store our project files. We use Project Libre to track the pro pro project progression. We use the winner list to improve our working efficiency because it supports us to deal with the day-to-day -day task. And, uh, our team member will receive re emails when every time when a task was assigned to them or they have a task due very soon. Now let's dive into our audiobook localization. Before we kick off our project, we, our uh, account manager actively communicated with our client and, um, so that we can understand our client needs. Here is a letter from our client. From this letter, we understand that our target audience is the children as the hospices and also those with adopting families. And our mission is to comforting and uh, entertaining. Our project is to localize uh, children's book, The Peter's King's uh, Papers, from English into simplified Chinese. And it is a collection of fun stories from which we chose uh, 14 for our projects. And the target uh, format is PDF, EPUB, and also an audiobook uh, in MP3. We follow the general workflow uh, of TP dubbing and the DTP. The, uh, the, the duration of our time, uh, audiobook is 145 minutes and we translated approximately 19,000 words. Here is the memo source. We use it as our translation management system and also our CAD tool. We have very experienced translators. They are mid students majoring in translation, and they are very uh, good at using the CAD tool. They are dedicated and promise to prioritize our project uh, translation. And um, before the translators started to do their work, we developed style guide and terminologies, which are really important when it comes to literature translation. Um, we ensured uh, the quality and also consistency by modifying our style guide according to the feedback from our translators. And our responsible account, uh, vendor manager also follow up with the translators regularly in order to check their translation progression. Thanks to the great work of our translator, our TEP part has been finished and uh, with a very uh, large volume of translation and also fast speed and high quality proof by our positive uh, feedback from our clients. And then as we finish the TEP part, we move to the exciting part, the dubbing, and my colleague Sophie will tell you more about it. Thank you, Chang. So after the translation has been done, we now move forward to the dubbing part. 
And for the dubbing, here is a brief summary. We have 14 stories all together, and the translated Chinese character count is 28,000 word characters. And we have eight main story characters and a lot of other characters. So there are a lot of conversations in the story. And the time duration for dubbing is three weeks. As you can see, we have a very limited timeline, so we devoted 20% of our time for the preparation, 50% time for the actual dubbing and voice recording, and then a final 30% time for the finalization. So um, thanks to our dear friend Lulu, we borrowed her personal studio with a lot of professional studio equipment and also we have chosen Adobe Audition as our software dubbing software. And then in the meantime, we did the file preparation. We have marked the conversation flow with different colors to highlight the conversation. And we have shared the synchronized documents and the dubbing instructions through Google Doc with all our dubbers. So uh, one of our main tasks is to find all the dubbers for all the stories because we have so many uh, characters in the story. So luckily we got a lot of voice talents right here in our classroom. So here are our dubbers. And another special thank to Lulu because uh, Lulu is a very professional dubber and she has provided us a lot of professional advice and uh, dubbing technical support in the process. And so our workflow is that we will uh, record every character's sound separately in Adobe firstly, and then we will integrate their sound together in Adobe on different tracks. So uh, here we have an actual demo for what we did. Yo 其他人都叫的, so, maybe you have recognized many very familiar voices in this process. Yes, they are all our classmates. So uh, for every story, we added a zooming music at the start of the story. And then we try to integrate all the sound together to make it sound more natural instead of just the monologues. And also we did some after effects to try to create some new sound in the story. For example, we like a children's sound, so we tweak the sound of Yarong sound to create a children. And also Amber's voice was actually edited to two different roles, a boy and a girl. So let's now move forward to the desktop publishing part presented by Amber. Desktop publishing. We used InDesign to create the PDF version of our ebook, and we got our source file in the PDF format, and we obtained it from the Gutenberg project. Um, after TEP and the fi double finalization, we copy and pasted everything into InDesign. The page setting and style we used, uh, we tried to use the same setting as the source PDF. And also um, the font we use, uh, the Chinese font we use is Kaiti, and we added a two character indent at the beginning of each paragraph. And also there were 74 images total. We had to insert the images manually for all of them. Um, you have to understand, uh, the desktop publisher needs to understand Chinese in order to insert them in the correct place, corresponding to the story plot and dialogue. Luckily, all of us understand Chinese in our group. And some of the images were re uh, their sizes were changed in order to reduce the blank space at the last page of each story. And here is an example of the English story and the Chinese story.
Besides the PDF version, we also created the EPUB version of our ebook. Um, for this one, we didn't really add any special effects or styles because the reader can adjust their own reading preferences when they're reading the book electronically. And next, we have document translation. So another project we did for the client as a document translation, and one of the example is the certificate translation. So we got this certificate from the client, and actually it's a picture, and the client asked us to translate it into traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese. And here is our final work for simplified Chinese and traditional Chinese. So uh, what we did is that we used the word to create a picture list and store all the translation strings. And at the same time, we used the Photoshop to try to create a similar uh, style for the Chinese and English. And we pay special attention to the details. For example, all the color dots, we have localized them into simplified and traditional Chinese. And another project we did for the client is the website consulting. So actually, they already have a Chinese website. However, uh, they can actually do a better job. For example, this donation page in Chinese. So uh, their pages are built on um, are in HTML format, and we try to keep the consistency. So what we did is a pilot project that is complicated, complete, complete in MemSource using their CMS WordPress. So um, our first suggestion is that they should replace PayPal with Alipay because that is the most popular plugin and payment method that is used in China. And they have a plugin in WordPress as well for Alipay. Also, uh, we try to mimic the same style, try to create the same style in MemSource and try to keep the consistency along the way. Now let's move forward to the challenges and the achievements in our projects. Uh, we did uh, experience a few challenges in this process. Um, first is the difficult meeting deadlines. Um, at first, when we set our timelines, they've seemed very plausible. However, things did not turn out to be exactly as we, we expected, and for our Book, uh, lo storybook localization process on um, all the steps are dependent on the previous task so we couldn't really do many things simultaneously uh, one or two very small delays of one task could cause the delay of the entire process and also for our um, for our book the target audience is very young children so we have to uh, adapt the language to um, accommodate their reading level. We did take this into consideration at the beginning and we provided a style guide. However, it was not sufficient or it wasn't detailed enough. Fortunately, our translators were very experienced and they were great at adapting this and providing us feedback. So we were able to develop a full um, style guide at the end. And we, um, everyone, all the translators were very great at using MemSource. However, not all features were utilized. Uh, we built a term base at the beginning to ensure that special names and terms could be consistent. However, uh, it was not used by all the translators, so we had to spend some extra time editing and fixing the terms at the end. And of course, achievements. And the communication between the three of us went seamless, and the collaboration um, be, uh, with all the other volunteers went great as well. And we had lots of fun during the process. We, Especially the dubbing part, we laughed at almost every line we said. And we were able to taste amazing food too. Uh, our client, Stephanie, she was really helpful and supportive to us throughout the entire process. And we're really grateful that at the end, she gave us very positive feedback. And above all, the greatest achievement we have done is that uh, we, are, uh, we were able to help the children who are in need, and this has added meanings to our lives too. And I want to express my appreciation to all our uh, volunteers. Without your talent and your time, we couldn't have done this. And I want to thank you for listening to our presentation today. If you have any questions, you can contact us. Thank you. Thanks, CSA Studio. Next up, Lingua. Lauren, Katrine, and Jerry will discuss their localization project this summer for the IGDA, the International Game Developers Association, an organization which fosters game developers and game development communities worldwide.
Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are Loke Lingua for the IGDA. I'd like to quickly introduce our team. Um, I'm Lauren Scanlon. I was the account manager for this project. Uh, Katrin Liebert is our main project and vendor manager, and Chen Wen Jerry Chen is our localization engineer and DTP manager. That being said, we all uh, helped out on each of these roles because of our small team. So when we started this project, we talked with our client about what their needs are. Our client is the IGDA, or the International Game Developers Association. Their goal is to connect game developers in small communities across the globe. Right now, there are about 8,500 members in about 90 professional and academic chapters all over the world. Um, so when we approached the IGDA, we were thinking of maybe doing a website localization project as well as some PDF and DTP work. That being said, um, our client asked us ultimately not to do a website project because their content is so dynamic and always changing, it doesn't make sense for their needs. So we concentrated on doing five PDFs, which mainly deal with um, chapter creation, special interest group creation, etc. Um, so <laughs> this turned out to be about uh, 3,300 source words in uh, those five PDFs across eight languages, which were simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, Korean, Russian, Brazilian, Portuguese, Spanish, French, and German. Uh, this ended up being almost 27,000 words total. Uh, we also were asked to do a PDF uh, sort of transcreation adaptation project where the client provided us with a PDF that they use, or a banner um, that they use in their work and asked us to make it more international. So I'm going to let my teammates talk to you more about that. Uh, we also developed a translation kit for the IGDA to use in their future projects. Now I'm going to let Katrin tell you about the project structure. Okay, so um, yes, let's talk about the project structure. So the first thing would be to source for linguists and um, deciding on which languages to go for. We did that mainly in the meetings with the client. The first one, the kickoff meeting, we're talking about possibly, you know, which languages to localize into. And um, for example, Japanese was one language that we cut out because the IGDA has already got um, um, big members, um, membership community that is already contributing a lot of volunteer translation. So yeah, as Lauren said, um, the other eight languages were the ones we decided on. And we had meetings with the um, different linguists and um, of course, um, yeah, email exchange to um, set kind of like the work that we would require from them, for example. And um, we also had a resource document where we tracked which resource would, was working for which language because it was quite a lot of languages and files. So um, and since we've kind of been fluid with some roles, like we all did a little bit of project management or, you know, like any kind of linguistic work, for example, as well. I did some translation myself. Um, we had that um, resource document. Um, then um, this leads to the next um, slide, um, which is scheduling and batching. So um, we decided to put it into three batches because of the um, different linguists had other projects as well and kind of to keep a better overview. And um, we then decided on the priorities, like talking to the client, which one would be of the highest priority. And the first batch was one file, and the second and third were um, the remaining two files, two and two. Um, the workflow included also um, yeah, translation, edit um, from missed students or resources. And um, we also decided to add another step, which is uh, like to have a have it overlooked by subject matter experts from the IGDA, which um, leads to my next slide, and that is the IGDA review, because we wanted to ensure that the content we deliver is kind of coherent with the, the language that the um, IGDA members use, because the files that we delivered or the um, translations we did was about kind of acquiring new members um, and studio affiliates or academic affiliates so that was the content of the translation so we wanted to make sure that it's consistent with the other um, promotional material that the IGDA has so um, there was one thing that we encountered throughout the process where we would have maybe made a different choice now if we did it again so the review we actually did that um, 
outside of world server so we wanted to make sure that we have a file like a translated file and then the reviewed file will be able to track what has been changed kind of to you know just have an overview and that's why we didn't um, do the review in world server because we ended up not being able to retract a file um, that the original translated file and the reviewed file separately because when you go to world server at the end the project is done you'll just get one file and that is the final one so um, however doing it outside of world server led to a lot of tm updates and we figured out maybe memsource would have been something great to do because there's the bilingual files that you can just upload and um, that would have saved us some time on doing all the tm updates for example um, so yeah and there's other things that you thought we thought about maybe you know in world server it's a bit more like specific to the person the client like you have to set up everything like the workflow all these kinds of different things the memsource i think it's maybe a little bit more automated so for this kind of project we would have probably gone better with um, memsource because of all the different languages and the amount of files um yes so we did the brochure localization what um that was the big project what i just talked about into all these languages and um we thought that yeah it was a, a good project because we wanted to you know help the igda reach their members and that was the main content about um the documents that we localized but we also did uh, the other project that jerry is going to talk about now and thank you Okay, so um, beside the main project, the five PDF file project, we also did uh, two other kind of like servers uh, and similar to projects. So one of them is the translation kit because for those for these five PDF files, this is the first time that they are being translated. So we are providing the um, database and translation memory and style guides. So the, our first step is to um, extract the terms for our translators. So we use uh, Okape, no, Okapi, Okapi Rainbow to extract the terms. The first step we use it, it ends up with like 200 terms, 200 words, and then we have to manually clear that out with Excel and at the same time uh, looking at those source, source file. And in the end, we put that back into Moda term and then put that into World Server. But during the process of ex extract, extracting the terms, we found out that there are some inconsistency uh, in the source files. So for example, there are some formatting inconsistency. Some of the words are aborted in one document, but not in the other document, that, that kind of situation. So we decided to contact our client and make sure which, which, uh, which format is the, the format that the client wants. And we just we created a style guide for our translator and also for our client. And also the translation memory, um, like Katrin has said, we manually updated the trans translation memory a lot, and that's cost that cost us some time. But in the end, it's it's kind of worth it because we need those files, and but also because we separate the the file the project into three batches. So after the first batch is done, we update the, menu, uh, the, the translation memory so that our translator can use that translation memory in our third and second and third batch. And uh, the other project is the banner adap adaptation. As you can see on, the, on your left hand side, it's the original one. It's the original banner. And the document, the file we received is a J JPEG document. So we didn't receive uh, the original source file, which should have been maybe PSD file. So we have to create our own PSD file with our photo with Photoshop. But they caused us some problem because there are no layers in within. We have to do some magic with the the Photoshop. Use probably magic wand or other function in Photoshop. So that ends up, we come up with these other two banner. The the one in the middle, we just make the dots brighter because if you see the original one, it's really dark at the background. And our client wishes us to make the banner look more international. But 
the original one is already kind of international because of the map, as you can see on the second one. And there are some words on, at the background, but it's just not easily visible. If you don't zoom in a lot, then you cannot see anything. So we ended up, we decided to make the dots brighter so that you can see the map. That they, then it should be a little bit more, look like more uh, international. And we also added some other languages into the, the banner so they look more um, international. And next, Lauren is going to talk about the challenges and success we have. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, yeah, so this was a great project. And one of the things that was very cool and challenging for us at the same time was how many linguists that we worked with. Uh, going into eight languages with just the three of us was tough. So we enlisted a lot of help uh, from others, both friends at the school and friends outside of the school. Uh, we also are very thankful to our IGDA reviewers who are generally professionals in the field and often are working in localization themselves. So we're very excited to work with them. Um, but this was challenging for us, for the th just the three of us, to keep everybody on schedule, to answer queries that came up, um, and to make sure that everyone was on the same page. So one of the things that we did to sort of help combat the confusion was to have a in-person meeting here at MISS with the people that could attend. So we talked through World Server, we talked through some of the issues, helped people in person get to their files, get to the terms that they needed, um, and also just sort of talked through some of the game-specific terms. A lot of the stuff that the IGDA deals with is pretty industry-specific terms, even when you think of video games that everyone knows and, and enjoys. Um, some of the words in the documents aren't as familiar, so we wanted to make sure that all the translators, as much as possible, were on the same page. Um, another one of the challenges we had was with our TMS. We sort of shot ourselves in the foot with our selection. Uh, we decided on something that we were very familiar with, but wasn't necessarily the best choice for the project. So if we did it again, uh, we would spend more time initial, on the initial TMS selection and sort of figure out what our project was going to need and what would work best for that. Finally, uh, one of the really cool things about this project is how creative we could get uh, with the banner and with the documents themselves. Um, our client was really great in working with us and giving us a lot of freedom, and so we really had kind of a lot of fun figuring out how exactly we were going to tackle this project and what we were going to do. So, uh, again, I want to thank you all for coming and thank our client. Thanks, Lok Lingua. All right, next up, Lok Yu, Barry Christina. I can't say Lok Yu without smiling. Lok Yu. Lok Yu. Barry, Christina, Lucy, and Xijing from uh, Lok Yu will discuss their localization project this semester for API Equality Northern California, an organization which builds, which builds LGBTQ API power to amplify their voices and increase visibility in their communities. Take it away, Lok Yu. Thank you, Max. Hello, everyone. We are Lok Yu. The project that we have been doing is the website localization for API equality in Northern California. So um, API equality in Northern California is a nonprofit organization that supports LGBTQ movements for Asian Pacific Islanders in Northern California. And our team consists of four people. Uh, Yuyin Xi Lucy is a project manager. Si Jing is an engineer. Uh, Xu Li Christina is a TEP coordinator. And my name is Heng Wu, and the account manager of this project. Although we took different responsibilities, as the project progressed, we um, put on different heads as needed. Now I'm going to show you a short video that will give you an overall look of our project.
okay, uh, we're very proud of what, what we have accomplished within sh such a short time. Now we're going to talk about how we make this happen. I'm going to introduce um, the work visits. There are overall five work visits, uh, request for proposal, then translation kits preparation, then um, translation editing and desktop publishing. The fourth phase is content import and on-screen QA, and then we finalize the project and deliver that to our um, client. In the first phase, we propose a plan to our client API Equality Northern California. After we confirm the specifications of them, uh, we issued a statement of work and a purchase order. Then in the second phase, we migrated the website to our testing website. We prepared the source file, recruited 11 translator, uh, translators from China. We prepared the TM, TB, reference materials, and the project instructions. Then in the translation, editing, and DTP phase, um, the 11 translators translated the content in Memsource Cloud. We edited the content, and two DTP specialists performed the DTP work. Then in the fourth phase, after the content is imported to the website, we performed on-screen QA and then fixed all the bugs. After that, we finalized our file and linguistic assets and delivered to our client. Now we love to share some uh, uh, practices and reflections on this project. Thank you, Christina. Um, now I'm going to share our um, experience on project management. The first thing that I want to talk about is the automation tools that we used in this project. We used nine tools in total uh, because we used nine tools in total because uh, our client site is WordPress based. So we used the WordPress uh, plugin QTranslate X. And as for CAD tool, we used MapSource Cloud to um, uh, run scope. Uh, set up a TMTB, translate files, and perform QA. Um, to facilitate our team communication and file transfer, we used several platforms uh, such as Basecamp, Evernote, and Google Drive. We did uh, DTP work using Photoshop, and also we used um, Adobe After Effects and Audition to uh, create our um, project demo. Uh, the second thing that I want to say is about the organized workflow. Although we started our um, project a little bit late, but uh, and it's not a small project, so we were concerned that we will uh, not be able to meet the deadline. But it turned out that an efficient workflow really helped us get started immediately and um, uh, saved us time. And in terms of internal management, we have a shared folder on Google Drive that stores uh, all the files that we need for this project. And we have a team meetup on a regular basis um, to propose the solutions to, uh, to the problems that we encountered. And the last one is a detail. We have a keen eye for detail, and we focused on every detail, such as font, uh, file format and punctuation, etc. And now, please let Christina to talk more about the vendor management. Okay, thank you, Lucy. Uh, now, I would love to share some of our experiences and lessons learned from a vendor management and CRM perspective. This is a project of over 29,000 English words uh, with 11 translators work, working remotely from China. To work cross time zones was not an easy job for us to manage. When we first started to recruit the translators, we got a very good response from the Chinese translators. We were able to have enough um, candidates to choose from, and we also have backup translators in case anything happens. But we still don't want to have any um, people uh, quit halfway through after the project that starts because we really cannot afford any delay and that will affect our falling tasks. 
Um, therefore, we've made it very clear what we're going to do, what client we're going to work for, and what the workload will exactly be before the translators are officially um, onboarded. And we're like, very lucky to have a group of very responsive and responsible translators who supported us all the way through this project. And another issue is that before the, trans, um, the translation actually started, we expected the communication process might be very time consuming, uh, given the fact that we work remotely in different time zones. Then um, to save more time, we think we need to make sure there's no mistake or confusion in the instructions we provide to them. Therefore, we reviewed every instruction at least twice and have everything tested out before we hand them to the translators. That did help us to save a lot of time as the pro uh, project proceeded. Um, also, our translators are actually all um, first-time MemSource users. Therefore, we provide them with a very detailed video uh, tutorial for them to use and a step-by-step -step PDF instructions. And they found that very useful when, we, when they were learning how to use the platform. When the project actually uh, started, we use a discussion board to answer the questions from the translators instead of replying to their uh, emails individually. Uh, that helped us to reduce the workload of the coordinator and also uh, we were able to guarantee the information got by the translators were all consistent. Also, the translators were asked to um, report their translation progresses uh, on the discussion platform every day. Um, actually, I was able to oversee their progresses um, every day. But what we're thinking is that since this is a volunteer work, they might tend to procrastinate or delay their jobs, but we really cannot afford any delay. We want to keep them motivated uh, by asking them to report their progress every day. Um, we were able to make them mot motivated by peer pressure. And we also did a great job in terms of CRM. We actively collaborated with um, our client. We engaged them in our uh, glossary creation and final review process. We reported our uh, progress every week and also have bi-weekly Skype meeting with our client. We were um, invited to one of our client's events last week. We drove to San Francisco and had a great time with our client and their community members. We also had some uh, technical exploration, and now Barry's going to talk about that. Thank you, Christina. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the CAT tools that we use in this project. Um, in the process of translation and editing, we encounter a problem. When the translators were translating the files, the translations were uploaded to the cloud in real time. However, when it came to the editing phase, the editors had a really hard time in distinguishing the, between the original uh, approved translation memory and the new ones from the translators. So we were thinking if it would be possible to give the editors the original translation memory only and have the translators to work collaboratively through cloud at the same time. And we, all, we were also thinking, what about giving translators and editors uh, desktop translation memory and um, only instead of using cloud translation memory. So there is a question, what are the advantages and disadvantages of desktop translation memory and cloud translation memory? So first of all, desktop translation memory. If the editors are given the approved original translation memory only, he will, will she he or she will not be affected by the new uh, memory created by translators. Desktop translation memory is not restricted by the internet, so it can be accessed quickly regardless of the size of the translation memory. However, if the desktop translation memory is given to translators and, and editors, the translation company takes the risk of losing their language assets and the translation memory cannot be shared remotely in a group. Then, what about cloud translation memory? 
Cloud translation memory can be shared remotely and is searchable anytime, anywhere with the internet. In additionally, translators and editors are not allowed to download the TM and TB, so the security of language assets is guaranteed. But at the same time, the cloud translation memory is restricted by the internet access, and the search results come out very slowly when the memory is very big or the internet speed is not fast enough, which will greatly affect work efficiency. So what would be the best solution to the problem that we faced? Because of uh, the time constraints, I can't explain everything details. After some research, I found that the best solution will be working with uh, desktop translation memory and cloud translation memory at the same time. For example, SDL Trados Studio allows desktop translation memory to be encrypted at different levels in order to ensure the security of language assets. At the same time, we can use SDL Group Share to centralize, share, and collaborate on all our translation projects. And in this project, we use WPML and QTranslate X, uh, and our engineer Su Jin is going to talk about the differences. Um, thank you, Barry. So, in the middle of our project, we experienced a change in the multilingual plugin that we used. We changed from WPML to QTranslate X. The main reason that we decided to make the change is that um, after we translate the site title and the tagline into Chinese, the Chinese tagline displays even in the English version of the website, as you can see from the screenshot. We consider this as a very serious bug because tagline is what people first see when they visit the site. And since for now a large proportion of the uh, visitors are native English speakers, we don't really want our client to take the risk of messing up their English version's website. So we've decided to change to QTranslate X, but we still keep WPML in one of our testing sites for experiment purposes, and then we get to compare the two different most used multilingual plugins. And we think it's a good idea for us to share this experiment experience with you. Uh, QTranslate X and WPML, they work differently. QTranslate X stores different languages for each post in the same post, but WPML uh, stores the content of uh, all the languages in two different poses and link them automatically via the plugins. So if we used different plugins, we will have different processes. If we use QTranslate X, the site administrator need to copy and paste all the sources manually and to the Word and send the files to translators for translation. After translated, the files also need to be sent back to the site administrator to be published on the website. WPML is much more automated. Um, there is well, uh, the site administrator does not need to communicate to the translators via emails. And, um, but there's one problem, because the file format is XCLEAF. So our translators need to convert XCLEAF to XML before translation. As you can see, QTranslate X is, this requires more manual work, but it's more intuitive. Uh, WPML is more automated, but it's more complex, especially that it involves a step of file format conversion. And WPML has a more complex architecture. It needs to hook to many different WordPress functions so that it can get more content to be translated. Therefore, if we use WPML, we can enjoy many, many more features. But QTranslate is much simpler. Uh, if there is something that it does not hook to, we need to insert the language text manually. But it also means that we have less things to break if we use QTranslate X. And uh, we are not saying here that which plugin is much better than the other ones. The reason we chose QTranslate X over WPML is that it's more suitable for our specific project. It's easy to use, 
and our website is relatively small website so it, even if it's a little bit manual our client does not need to spend a lot of time and efforts in using it and if there is an exit plan that means if in the near future our client decides to grow this website and localizes into more languages uh, they can always migrate their website smoothly from Qtranslate X to WPML because WordPress does provide support of this kind. So with all this back and forth, we finally come to wrapping up our project and we have received a feedback from our client that we really want to show you. Uh, we spent three months do, uh, working on our project. Um, uh, by doing this uh, API equality, uh, Northern California website localization project, we hope to help our client to uh, connect with more people who belong to this community. Also, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our volunteers for their contribution and our client for their support and especially uh, Miss TLM program and our academic advisor Max for teaching us all these skills for localization. Thank you. Thanks for that shout out, Loki. All right, next up, Loke Mania, comprised of Mason, Lisa, Daphne, Isabel, and Birgit, will present two localization projects they did for the Computer History Museum, a nonprofit organization based in Mountain View that explores the history of computing. Take it away, Loke Mania. Thanks, Max. Hello. I'm just going to introduce our team members real quick and then give you some background information on the Computer History Museum, which is, like uh, Max mentioned, located in Mountain View. Um, so, as you all know here in this class, our very first assignment was to um, secure um, our client and also put together a team. And um, so the very first question I asked myself was, um, wow, like, what should we focus on first, right? Because um, if you line up this really amazing client, then it's easier to recruit um, people and get them excited about the project. But on the other hand, if you have your team together, um, then you can gauge better like what you have to offer and you can maybe choose a client who can really benefit from that. So um, as for Logmania, it um, turned out to be um, kind of working out simultaneously. Um, the team came together um, and we secured the client kind of at the same time, but um, it still took like about two weeks. Um, I prepared a list of like potential clients and um, I really wanted to pitch the museum, right? So I put it right on the top of the list and that's how I became to be the account manager for this project. Um, Lisa took the role um, of project management and Isabel uh, desktop publishing. Daphne was in charge of QA and then Mason was our go-to engineering person. <laughs> The client. Uh, the Computer History Museum has been around for um, almost 40 years, so it's really well established. Um, it has the reputation of being the world's leading institution that ex explores computer history, and I think it really lives up to that. Um, it's really worth a visit, and um, it's really nothing less than what you would expect from an institution located in the heart of the Silicon Valley. So in the museum, for example, you can see like a Cray-1 supercomputer, you can see like old IBM machines, you can see Apple One and uh, self-driving cars. So like as you walk through the museum, you can really explore like how um, computing developed over the past few decades. And um, also they have like temporary exhibitions. For example, they just up until recently had a um, Babbage machine and they like showed how it works and it's like super exciting. So um, while we were still on winter break, Isabel and I actually went to the museum to um, 
first of all to check out like who is like the you know the customer of the museum kind of to get a feel um, of the target audience um, but also to have a first kickoff meeting with the client and um, so we came prepared and we kind of showed them what we can do for them and uh, the museum already had a um, good idea of what they actually wanted us to do because they have like some materials for the vid visitors that they wanted us to localize into several languages and um, before the meeting we were actually thinking we would provide the languages that we can offer um, within our team but the client really wanted Japanese and Russian and so at some point we decided to really focus on um, trying to get as many languages as possible and um, so this would create um, added value for the client and for us it actually posed a challenge because so far we are all, we worked mostly with languages we're very familiar with and so how can I assure the quality when I'm myself not able to actually read the target uh, file so um, we were really lucky to recruit really amazing translators that did some quality work for us and um, we can't thank them enough so that was really exciting and we were able to provide eight languages uh, German, French, Brazilian Portuguese, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, um, what am I missing here, <laughs> gosh, Japanese, Japanese Russian. and Russian, yes. So um, while we go through the presentation there will be like a little, let's see, a little bar on the bottom where you can um, follow our workflow as we go through the presentation. Okay, so, hi, um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about recruiting translators and reviewers. This is our first project, it's about uh, the pamphlets introducing, you know, uh, available to the visitors, you know, visiting the museum. Yes, as uh, Birgit mentioned, you know, we've decided to uh, uh, offer the clients to localize the pamphlets, you know, into eight languages. So I think that that was one of our specialties. And as we know, that linguistic talents are uh, a key to the success of any localization project. And, uh, you know, since I've been having vendor management experience on my internship, so I offered to take the role of vendor manager, um, recruiting, you know, uh, translators and, and uh, reviewers. But um, as you can see from our team, you know, our team is so linguistically uh, diversified. You know, each one of us comes from a different language locale. So, you know, the team itself can do five locales. But uh, though I'm, uh, I am the uh, vendor uh, manager, everyone on our team contributed a lot in recruiting uh, translators. We just mobilized, you know, every connections we have. We talked to our friends, we talked to our professors, and Mason talked to his roommate, and his roommate talked to his girlfriend. <laughs> Okay, and finally we got everything, and I have to say, out of the eight languages, you know, um, French is really one of the languages that we had some kind of trouble, because as we know that, you know, on the uh, entire campus, there's no native French speakers in the second year, and there's only one native speaker in first year. So uh, her name is Charlotte. So here I have to uh, thank Daphne. <laughs> yeah, she uh, offered to uh, invite Charlotte to coffee and uh, talk to her about how amazing our pro project was going to be. And, uh, you know, she just, you know, got Charlotte. And, you know, we're going to, you know, pay you the money, <laughs> split the, the, the coffee money. Well, so uh, we got our uh, translate, and we also managed to have different uh, people handling translation and, and reviewing. That's kind of the uh, standard in the industry. Uh, uh, so here, you know, I like to, as Birgit said, uh, express our sincere gratitude for the work ethic uh, our translator and reviewer have demonstrated. You know, they hand, uh, they. Uh, uh, they deliver translation on time and they did very uh, good job uh, and they were very open to co uh, open to communication whenever they have questions you know we communicate through email and uh, our engineers Mason our uh, DTP specialists would jump in and you know it's very uh, friendly ambiance within our team with translator and reviewers uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, we 
you know, um, uh, as we benefited a lot from our translators and, and reviewers, our translators also express that they have learned a lot through working with us. And now I'm going to read just a line uh, from the email that sent by one of our traditional Chinese translators. She goes, uh, well, Lisa, um, uh, thank you for inviting me because I learned so much in this project. And thanks, thanks for inviting me. So I'm so um, you know glad and, and, and you know grateful that we have such fabulous uh, talents working with us. Okay, now uh, we'll have Mason. Yeah. So now, before we started launching the project and we're waiting on the source files from the client, I set up a few internal things, uh, good communication. So the first was I set up a company website so the client could get a better idea of who we were. Since only two of our team went to the kickoff meeting, we wanted them to know that they were in good hands and that their translations were in good hands. So it's just a quick little site about who the team is, what our roles are, what our languages are, the languages we can offer, who we are, and how to contact us. And then I also set up an internal system for us to communicate because we needed a centralized location to put all of our files, put all of our tasks, everything, all the information we needed needed to be in one place. So I created a tracker for us to track all of our work. And we also made a task so we could write tasks to each other and make sure they were getting done. And then we needed somewhere to store all of our files. So we chose Google Drive to store, all, to store our files. And this is the general structure that we went with. So we had a project folder and then an individual folder for each department for miscellaneous things for the department. Then within the projects, we broke it down into the different steps. And production is where most of the files are and most of the stuff happened. And we needed to make sure that we had you know, the different QA steps, the DTP, and the review. So everything was in order of how we did it. And now Daphne will talk about QA and Glossary. So after Basin set up our internal um, communication channels and the folder structures, it's time for us to jump in and started to prepare for a translation. But before that, we need to prepare a translation toolkit, which contains glossaries and style guides. And this is a glossary that we create for our vendors and also for the future use of our clients' projects. So we invite our vendors to also help fill in the blanks that we need for all the terms that we extracted from the source. And the, in the tabs, they, you can see there are do not translate tabs, which contains product names and company names that we hope to keep in English. The exception uh, case, the exceptional case is for both Chinese because uh, Chinese readers, you, it's used to reading names that translate it into Chinese. So except for Chinese, everything else, our product and company names are in English. And for style guides, we take reference uh, from Microsoft style guides and compile this one that specifically suits the needs for our projects. And we also, after that, we also ask our reviewers to review and validate all the language-specific style guides that we provide before this translation even started. OK, after setting up, uh, having created the glossary and the style guide, the next step was to figure out which tool to use. Because we had our internal uh, uh, tracker, we even considered just sending to the translators a Word document and having them choose which tools they want to use. But then we realized that using Memsource Cloud, we would have some benefits. For example, we could have a, they could benefit from the TM because some may, they may have tools to just translate in the Word document. And by translating into Memsource, they would use the translation memory that we created and also make sure that all terminology were consistent. And we would be able to follow the project, the, the, pro the progress of the translation as well. So having tools to work with Memsource Cloud, what I did was to create PM accounts to our team members so we could all follow the project progress. 
And then I also create account for our resources. So they could log into MemoSource and use the web-based workbench they offer. After done that, I just upload the files into MemoSource, create the project, create a TM, and assign the work for the translators. They had, most of the translators had experience using MemSource or any other CAD tool, and after you learn how to use a CAD tool, it's not that complicated to work with a different one. So we, we didn't have to do much. Sometimes they had questions, but it was very easy, and we handle, and they did a work job with MemSource, and we're very happy that we could fall, uh, keep track of the progress and be consistent with the terminology. Now, Daphne will talk about a specific issue one of the translators had during the translation. So during the translation stage, we do have several questions from our vendors. And as you can see, this is one of the pages uh, in our map. And this map actually occurs in several pamphlets. So our Japanese translator, she brought this where to into our attention, is that she doesn't, she at that time, she didn't understand how to handle this because there's no um, explanation of what where to is. And after some research, we found out that where to actually, it's a exhibit, exhibit launched by the museum. It's about the, the history of auto, autonomous vehicles. So we thought that where to, it's a pun, and there's two meanings. One is when you get into a self-driving car and the car will ask you, where do you want to go? And the second meaning is uh, where the self-driving car will lead us to in the future. So we uh, provide this information to our translator and let her know that for our Chinese translator, we found out that instead of asking us, they already translated as a history of autonomous vehicles. And this is their solution. And we let our Japanese translator and other uh, translators of other locales to decide what kind of solution they think it will be the best for their target audience. And we'll now go to talk about DTP. Okay, after we finished translation review, the next step was DTP. We had to work with two main tools for DTP, in design and illustrator, and because we are translating into eight languages, we decided to divide the work among our team members, so everyone got to do at least DTP for one language. So for the, we had, we translated two pamphlets. The two pamphlets had two pages. So the first page, page looks something like this. And for this page, we had to use InDesign. We had some challenges to, uh, while we use InDesign. The first one was the font. We didn't have the original font. So we had to match and download from the internet and install on our computers to be able to match this the target to the source files. Another uh, issue was text expansion for some languages like Brazilian Portuguese, and at the same time, text contraction for Chinese. As you can see in this, like we can see how different both it looks because of the expansion and contraction. And also, it was very hard to have access to the two, and because we're all using the two, we had to figure out where the best way, uh, place to work. And I guess most of us end up working at DLC and use the InDesign there. And for the map, we had to use Illustrator. I would say the biggest issue working on Illustrator was to recreate the text boxes because all the English text boxes were not edible. So we, what we had to do, we had to recreate text boxes and hide the English text to be able to match. And then we had like, we also had to remember to link the Illustrator file with InDesign so we would update the image on InDesign. And here we can see one more example of the German translation as well. We also had some expansion for German. And now Mason will talk about some specific issues he had while do doing Russian DTP. So the Russian DTP gave us the most problems because one of the reasons was, I think, Russian expanded the most out of all of the languages. So as you can see, this caused text to overlap. So I had to find some creative solutions on how to work around this. One of them was there was a lot of white space in the margins, so we had to get rid of some of that by moving the rows up and down to give us more room. I also had to reduce the letting and the font size. 
And another issue was the font, original font in Russian didn't have a bolded version to it. So I had to find a similar font that, did, that was bold to make the headers. And then above the pictures, there's the little titles. That, it was impossible to make it fit on one line like the original without making it size 2 font. So we had to break it into two lines, but luckily we had extra space by taking up the white space. And after the first round of DTP, we decided to, as a group, print out everything we did and look at them side by side and discuss our issues that we had to figure out workarounds. And then it was a good way because we realized that things we did for one, prod for one language was a good solution for other languages. And this really gave us a good overview and allowed us to come up with creative solutions. Now, the second project we did was a video subtitling for some of the promotional videos, for two promotional videos on their website. And now Daphne will tell you more about the subtitling. So um, here's our workflow. Uh, there are seven steps in total. So after we got the video, we immediately went into the preparation steps. And thanks to Mason, he's a native speaker, the only one in our group. So we will be able to have an accurate trans transcript of our video. And at the same time, we also create uh, SDR subtitle files in order for later's uh, on-screen subtitling step. And we put the transcripts uh, in Word doc format because that's the format that MemSource will be able to read. And then we go into translation. So after TP, we have one step is string shortening. So is this is uh, what we do for a string shortening. So uh, for APAC language, the character limits is 16 uh, characters. And for EMEA languages, it's at first, we thought uh, 20, 32 will be enough, but later on, we realized actually 40, it's, it's more reasonable for our case. And after that, we Im embed the subtitles into our videos and do a final on-screen uh, on QA. And please take a look of our video. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Luke Mania. Um, if you liked what you saw today and would like to learn more about the translation and localization management program, check out go.mist.edu forward slash TLM. Uh, thanks for watching.